Skylar. Yes. Okay, so um, the next thing coming up that Friday Nights is doing is the Downtown Canton Trick or Treat, uh, Arts District uh, Trick or Treat. So if you're in Downtown Canton and you have a kid or you are a kid or you want to be a kid, then come to 324 Cleveland Avenue Northwest in Canton and we'll be glad to let you up with goodies. Uh, we are actually doing non-food um, trick treats. So if you have a child who has allergies or other um, dietary restrictions, just look at to have a lot of fun. We are doing our second Friday show, as always, it also in downtown Canton at Makeshift Makerspace. And Azra, who is featuring? Or who are the um, We have a sword fight between... Sword fight between... Just, no, not, I'm sorry. Um, Kara? Kara Faluco. Kara Faluco and, and... I don't remember the other one. Kara Faluco and, and a so fabulous on. competitor who oh, is and, next. And Daria is going against Eva Graves. And Daria is coming. going against Eva Graves. So give it up for that awesomeness that will be gracing Canton in a couple of weeks. All right. So um, if anyone is not aware, we, we do have bathrooms in this space. We have uh, women type people over here and there's men type people over there. And um, there's when is the best time to write? Now. now. The best people to write? Us. And the best place to write? The outpost. Yay. <laughs> All right. Jason Moliterno began, began performing comedy in 2012. He drives around the Midwest, pleasing audiences with his strange observations, which he tries to pack with smart wit and a little absurdity. Then he leaves, finds a gas station, and buys their largest block of cheese. Jason won the Future Feature Contest in Akron, Ohio in 2017, has appeared in the Accidental Comedy Festival, Cleveland Comedy Festival, and the Whiskey Bear Festival, and was a 2018 Cleveland Comedy Awards nominee. Will you please welcome to the stage, Jason Malaterno! Hello everybody! So great to be here in Kent! Yeah, right? I'm from Youngstown, 
of high. Anyone been there? Yeah. No. Yes. Not lately. Not lately. And it's actually Youngstown is a city that uh, like everyone shits on it, but uh, I I actually always tell people that there's like actually a lot of fun stuff that you could do in Youngstown. I visited somebody in the psych ward there. Visited somebody at Belmont Pines. No, it was. Uh, no, sorry. How many psych wards do we have? At least two. Generations was the one that I was at. Okay, well, Youngstown is full of psych wards, apparently. Uh, isn't. What? Who? Something Canton is no longer. Oh, yeah, Youngstown's stealing all your psych wards. <laughs> yeah. You guys gotta come to Youngstown for your, for your psych stuff. No, there's a lot of stuff to do in Youngstown. You could, uh, you could go to a building that used to be a Long John Silver's, turn your car title into a cash loan. You can do your laundry at my parents' house. That's <laughs> basically. I I travel for comedy sometimes. I um I went to San Francisco, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, San Francisco is uh, it used to be the counterculture. You know what I mean in the '60s, and now it's just like it's just culture. I was hoping that San Francisco would remain the culture, the counterculture. I was hoping that that's where like the like the. Uh, like the neo-Nazis would be, and the flat earthers, and the people loyal to the British crown, the lepers. I was hoping that's what San Francisco would be, the true outcast. There was nothing, count the only thing that was counterculture in uh, San Francisco was uh, my girlfriend's fanny pack. That was it. That was the only thing that was counterculture. I, um, I did, when I was in San Francisco, though, I, uh, I saw a, a place that was called Cookies. And I saw it right when I was in the mood for a cookie. And I was like, all right, God exists. God exists, and for some reason, my cookie eating is very high on his list. Who am I to question him? But then I went there, and it was Cookie's clothing. Oh. Yeah. They were like, can I help you find something? And I was like, yeah. A snickerdoodle, you asshole. <laughs> Welcome to Cookie's Clothing. We're cooking up a cruel joke. I'm going to open a store called Puppies and we sell lamps. <laughs> I went to Italy this past year. You guys ever, uh, anyone take a vacation you can't afford? Just put it on your credit card? That's uh, highly recommended. Italy is basically, uh, it's, like, it's just like the Olive Garden but bigger. And your parents are not paying. I went to, uh, it's on Sistine Chapel. That's in Rome, Michelangelo did that. You're not allowed to speak when you go see the Sistine Chapel. And you're also not allowed to take a picture. And I think that's a great rule. If you want a picture of the Sistine Chapel, paint your own damn Sistine Chapel. Line a scaffold for all of your 30s trying to please a pope. <laughs> Michelangelo also did the Statue of David. That's in, uh, that's in Florence. So Mike Landry, he's like in all of Italy, like Rome, Florence. It's kind of like how I do comedy in Youngstown and Kent. You know what I mean? We're kind of <laughs> feeling we're kindred spirits. David is cool. David is a sculptor, of course, and he is, uh, he is naked. David is completely naked. Uh, which doesn't make sense because David, while being naked, has a slingshot over his shoulder. Uh, he is about to fight Goliath. Uh, is Michelangelo's story that David fought Goliath naked? Because that would actually that would actually answer a lot of questions, like like how David won, like Goliath like got to the fight and like he's just uh, he's just like, dude, are you naked? <laughs> oh shit! And then like that's when David shot him in the eye with this link. It was really pretty genius on David's part. You do when you see it live, you get a really good view of. Uh, you know, David's junk. And I gotta be honest, uh, Michelangelo nailed that ball sack. Like, he just, artist to artist. Uh, I mean, I defy any of you guys to go home and get some clay and just try to sculpt it, like, like a nuts. How many ridges would you put on it? How many ridges would you put on, on a ball sack? Five. Five? No. Over 9,000. Nine fats and a wrinkly ball sack. <laughs> I was thinking eight. I feel like eight's the right answer. I also, uh, oh, I did, uh, I got engaged when I was in Italy. I got engaged, which was a lot of fun. Mazel tov. Thank you very much. I thought the hardest part of getting engaged was buying the ring. And it, it, I just felt like a, 
big production, you gotta go to the mall, to a jewelry store, and you gotta talk to the best dressed man in all of retail. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? This poor guy that works at the jewelry store in the mall, he's like dressed like a duke. <laughs> but like you know he makes the same wage as the guy working next to him at Auntie Anne's Pretzels. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Find a ring, I had to pick a ring size. I didn't know rings had sizes. I was like, finger? <laughs> Take it in regular girl finger. <laughs> I'm excited to be married though. I think I got a good girl. I think it's gonna be good. Uh, but uh, the other, like a week ago, I uh, I complimented her and uh, she gave me shit for the way I compliment her. I only said four words. I said, you look pretty today. And she didn't like the word today. <laughs> so now, here's how I compliment her. I say, you look pretty today and every day. Every day is the beautiful gift of your face. Completely equal. Not at all changing. Always, if we grabbed your prettiness, it would be a straight line on the X app. Unless you want to get slightly more prettier with time. In which case, you wouldn't have disliked the original compliment. Let's just break up. I can't, I can't deal with this compliment anymore. Too much work. My fiance's name is Noel. The name Noel means Christmas. And yeah, and she was born in the month of May. So, uh, take that up for their mom. We were hanging out though last December, it was Christmas time, and we were at the mall, and I had to get her attention. And I was just like, Noel! And then it, it dawned on me that like, to the outside observer, it just sounded like I really loved Christmas. I was just a guy in a shopping mall in December, just going, Noel! Naughty God! Peace be with you! <laughs> I am fascinated by names. Um, there's a street near where I live, it's called New Road, N-E-W, New Road. It was apparently like named by the laziest guy ever. Hey Chuck, what do you want to name this new road? Yeah, that's good enough. He <laughs> named good. the New River in, uh, what is it, West Virginia too. Oh yeah, New River? That's, did he, does he not understand the aging process? I don't know. I don't know what it was. Maybe it's Old Man River now. Old Man <laughs> River. I, uh, I'll tell you my favorite name for a sports team. This is true, but Wikipedia does. In the 1800s, the Chicago Cubs, before they were the Cubs, they were the Chicago Orphans. <laughs> Isn't that the greatest name for a sports team ever, the Chicago Orphans? No logo puts fear in an opponent like a child holding up an empty porridge bowl. <laughs> How much the Chicago Orphans take on the Seattle seasonally depressed? <laughs> they were playing the Michigan malnourished. Yeah. I went to an Indians game um, before their season ended terribly. Uh, and uh, before the game, uh, on the Giants like, scoreboard, before the game, they had a public service announcement about swearing in front of children. Fuck no. Yeah, they had this little eight-year-old girl come on screen and she was like, we don't like it when adults swear. That's not true. Yeah, I was like, horse <laughs> shit, I remember being a kid. When your dad swore, the lost his temper, that was the best. They always, like, you always hear, like, you should never swear in front of kids. Like, think about it logically. Like, you should, like, swear in front of kids. They're the only ones that can really appreciate it. You know what I mean? I'm an adult. I can swear whatever I want. Fuck, dick, cock. There's no titillation. I get more joy out of saying the word titillation than I do from swearing. And then everyone knows what you text, and they, they try to get you to, you know, you type F-U-C-K, they try to get you to say duck, right? I even type dick, and they try to get me to say duck. You don't try texting your fiance, here's my duck pic. <laughs> weird. This would maybe make sense if duck were a word that you ever, I've never in my life texted the word duck. Never. But certainly not more than swear words. I could be texting like a duck salesman and I still would not text the word duck more than I do dick or fuck. I'd be like, $400 for a fucking mallard? What are you, a dick? <laughs> how long am I doing up here? I mean, how, how long do you want me to go? 30 minutes, oh, 20, 30 minutes? How long has it been? Like seven minutes. So 20, 13 more minutes? Yep. Nah, that's cool. No problem, we'll have fun. I, um, I been thinking about money a lot, because um, I recently paid off my student loans. You guys, Yay, you guys, well, hold your, I am in my 30s, so. You still did it. I still did it, yeah, it did take forever. But when you pay your, your student loans, 
like I would think back to what I'm paying for. Like I would think back to all the classes I took in college. Like when I was in college, you guys know that you still have to take a physical education class? I took bowling. I am still paying for college bowling from the University of Akron. It was half a credit. Half, you had to take billers the other half of the semester to make one credit. It's taught by a guy named Tony. No one, I didn't know, no one like knew his, I don't think anyone even asked what his last name was. Like every other class you ever take in college is like Dr. Flanahan. This guy was just Tony. One day he didn't show up for class and we were like, guess we're all just bull anyway. We already know how to do it. <laughs> What's the job in, I got, like, what's the job interview for bowling teachers? Can you sit there and do nothing while these kids bowl? Can you eat nachos, perhaps disgustingly, <laughs> licking your fingers at certain intervals? Can you chug this beer? You can be a bowling teacher. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I've been thinking about money. I went to my bank. Uh, and uh, recently, and it was closed. Not for the day, but just the bank was closed. Like it had a for sale sign in the window. Yeah. First of all, I think like, I'm gonna have to find a new place to get pens. <laughs> and dumb dumb suckers. Because I have not paid for those my entire life. I think that's why banks are going out of business. They've been willy nilly with the dumb dumb suckers and the pens for decades. True. Yeah. But they got, yeah, they got a for sale sign in the window. What do you even do if you buy a bank? First of all, who comes home like one day and is like, honey, I bought an old Huntington. <laughs> I didn't think about what you even do with this bank building, because like, you got the drive through thing with the tubes. You gotta use this for something, you know? You can't, you can't just start a hardware store. You gotta use the, t like, the only thing you can do, you gotta sell hamsters. You gotta sell hamsters, that's it. Cross out Unnington right answers, keep the green and white color scheme. <laughs> People roll up to your window, one hamster or two. <laughs> it's fun for the hamster, you guys are probably animal fans. You know, you might be worried that it'll be. I promise you, prior to putting a single hamster through one of the tubes, uh, we will run a bunch of tests uh, using gerbils. No hamster will be, will be hurt. I'm an animal person. I uh, I saw I saw a dog. A sir, uh, no, it was a it was a drug. I saw a drug sniffing dog in the mall, and um, my heart went out because he has to wear a sign that says no petting. Isn't that sad? Like he has to wear a sign that says, "Hey, maybe you know that thing I love." Don't do it. Yeah, don't do that. Also, he doesn't even know it's there, so he just thinks no one wants to pet him. He just goes home every night. He's like, no one's petting me. I don't know what's going on. It's sad because he's the one, like, 99.999% of dogs just sleep all day. But, like, 0.1% of dogs have to go to work. They have to sniff drugs. And then they don't even get any drugs. <laughs> they have to give the drugs to the cops. I'm not saying give drugs to dogs. I'm just saying find the right dose. You know what I mean? Just find the perfect dose that makes, just gives the dog the best hallucinogenic experience. Maybe they do get high with one sniff. Maybe who? Maybe they do get high with one sniff. Oh, and it's just like a ruse they got going? Uh -huh. All the dogs are like, hey, we're getting high off these drugs. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Meanwhile, the dog just thinks he's like the sultan of Sweet Toy Island. <laughs> I don't know what dogs think about. I don't know what they think about. It's like a mic. Kent, though. Kent is fun. Kent, I like Kent. You guys are what, from Canada? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, so you just come to Kent for... Okay, just to do this. I was in, I do, Kent, I do comedy in Kent uh, every Sunday and some Mondays. And uh, I was staying outside to the, college, the place we go on Sundays. And uh, there's this kid, probably about 20, and like he had a button on. It was an anti-Nazi button. It was like a swastika with a slash through it. I don't feel like you have to inform people that you're anti-Nazi. Like, are there people in this world that are neo-Nazis? Yeah. But you like, but we're just gonna assume you're not one. 
Like, you don't have to weigh in on the subject matter. Sure? Like, it's not news. Are you sure these days? Yeah, I was about to say, man, maybe a couple of years ago, but... Uh... Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I guess... I guess... <laughs> is there a Nazi epidemic in Kent that I don't know about? Uh, oh my god, is this it? <laughs> Oh my god, this is what the Nazi rally would look like. <laughs> it's just this giant space that they rent out on a Wednesday. <laughs> oh god. Um, okay, well don't do anything bad to me later. I do have some German in me, so I'm good with you guys, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll move on. What? Okay. <laughs> Oh man, I'll tell you about some of my fears. I get anxiety sometimes. Um, like whenever I, uh, whenever I pump gas at sheets, I get scared that I'm gonna accidentally say yes to the car wash. Uh -huh. You know what I'm talking about? Because uh -huh. you, you swipe your card for gas and then they go car wash, yes or no. And what's weird, it's like if the waitress was like, and would you also like your nails clip? Like it kind of, like it doesn't, I'm scared, like I'm terrified I'm gonna, hit that yes and I'm locked into like an eight hour car wash. It's like a long, it's like four hours long. It's like a long song and dance. A bunch of midgets ride on unicycles juggling squeegees. Or it's super fast but costs $10,000. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then like I just, I get mad and I yell at a midget. And then someone films it and they put it on YouTube. A new video called Man Being Mean to Midget. <laughs> it doesn't start at the beginning, like it starts right as I'm being mean to the midget. And I get ostracized, and I go wherever ostracized people go. It's Austria. I think in reality it's just the saddest car wash ever. I think some guy just walks out slowly dressed like Norman Bates, and he's just like, no one's ever said yes to the car wash before. <laughs> I'll go get mother. And he kills me. He was killed the whole time. There's a lot of serial killer shows on him. You notice that? Like, I go to Netflix. There's so many, like, the, like, the serial killer documentaries. And then there's also, like, like, fictional serial killer shows where, like, some guy just made up a serial killer. You know, like, some screenwriter just sitting in Starbucks. Like, maybe he only killed pharmacists. <laughs> the Adderall assassin. Yeah, I was in, I was watching one of them, oh, they're all the same, Criminal Minds, Law and Order, they're trying to catch this murderer, and uh, the guy in the FBI, he was like, hey, this guy commits murder, the reason he does it is he's impotent, and I thought, that's kind of weird, but good to know, because <laughs> apparently what they're telling you is if you're impotent, like, murder scratches the same itch. You know, like the doctor should really tell you that, like, can't get an erection, huh? Okay. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but have you heard of serial murder? <laughs> Here's a pamphlet, it's called Murder in You. Murder, a positive approach. Forward by Dick Wolf. Scared of the apocalypse? Anyone else scared of the apocalypse? Which one? I don't know. Now I'm more scared. <laughs> How many are there? Well, it kind of depends well, on what you believe. <laughs> well, those ones didn't happen. I always, here's the thing, I always think we're five years away from an apocalypse. That's why I don't make long-term plans. Like, you know that job interview question, like, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm always, like, probably in an abandoned root cellar, having resorted to cannibalism. <laughs> In movies about the apocalypse, they always know that it is the apocalypse. I'd be, the, I'd be like, is it the apocalypse? I, I need to know when I'm about to start pillaging. <laughs> they want to start pillaging and then I'm arrested. Then I find out it's, not, it's just a run-of-the-mill disaster. Then I'm arrested for pillaging. <laughs> I don't even know what pillaging is. I think it's just theft, but you're more of a dick about it. <laughs> pillaging it. Oh my god. You guys like sports, or is this a, this a, is this a non-sports crowd? Depends on the sport. What sport do you like? UFC. UFC? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. No? Baseball fans at all? Yeah. No, you always don't give a shit. Yeah. Okay. I'm a, I'm a Cleveland Indians fan. 
Yay sports ball. Yay who what? Soccer. Soccer? They do suck. They're, they really let you down. They're getting rid of uh, Chief Wahoo, though. Yay. That's good. Yeah, you guys, you guys like that? They're training him to the Yankees. <laughs> yeah. So he's their problem, though. Uh, Leo, I tell you what, a lot of people, everyone has their opinion on Jeep Wahoo. And um, I'll actually give you, I actually like Jeep Wahoo. And I'll tell you why, because Chief Wahoo has a smile on his face. He is a positive, have you guys taken a look at the other sports mascots? Every single one of them has anger management issues. <laughs> Denver Bronco looks like he's stuck in traffic. <laughs> Chicago Bull looks, he looks like he's in an internet argument with his uncle about gun control. <laughs> Arizona Cardinals, he squeezed the mustard bottle and only water came out. <laughs> then you have the San Jose Shark. The San Jose Shark is biting the hockey stick. <laughs> this guy doesn't even respect the equipment. <laughs> Chief Wahoo. Chief Wahoo looks like he just delivered a TED Talk on the power of positive thinking. <laughs> and he has a reason not to smile. For one thing, he's a chief with one feather. Where is his headdress? Mm -hmm. Never been discussed. We haven't won a championship since 48. He doesn't care, keep smiling. You know, in the 80s, our best player was Charlie Sheen. <laughs> I went to a playoff game two years ago. I sat in the upper deck because uh, they were cheap. I don't like the upper deck. It's not as good seats. I try to avoid it. But one thing I noticed when I was up there, no cup holders in the upper deck. But the lower deck does have cup holders. So somebody in the front office made a business decision, like lower deck, cup holders, upper deck, go fuck yourself. <laughs> should have been, should have had more money. I never sat in the middle deck, I don't know how that works. I assume the cup holders work 50% of the time. <laughs> they work until the fifth inning and then they open up like the claw game. <laughs> And your shit falls on the floor. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm paranoid that, I, that I, my hairline is receding. That's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. Every time I pass a mirror, I do this. And I'm like, am I losing any? And then when I see other guys, I, I maybe look at their hairline. And if they're, like, if they're going bald a little bit, I'm like, I like that guy. And if you have a full head of hair, I'm like, I don't like you. That's how I judge people now. Like a couple weeks ago, there was the, uh, everyone was talking about like the Brett Kavanaugh thing. And I gotta be honest, I was busy. I didn't listen to a single word of his testimony. I have no clue if he was guilty or not guilty. All I know is he's like 60 years old and he has a full head of hair. I saw that and I was like, fuck him. I don't care, do whatever you want with him. He won in life already. He's guilty in my book. I don't know. I think I'd be fine with going bald if it was, because it's like male pattern baldness is what they call it, but like, I don't, I don't like conforming. Yeah. So like the pattern shit, it's like I don't want to go, like I could totally handle balding if I like, like lost it on the sides and like kept it on the top. You know what I mean? Like Mr. T. I'd be like, yeah, I'm Jason, I got male non-pattern balding. It'd be great. I would totally prefer that. <laughs> All right, I'll say one or two more things to you guys, and uh, to get off the stage, think what, uh, what I want to say. I, um, I'm doing a lot of comedy uh, lately, and uh, I, uh, I end up, I, I use a lot of my, I used all my off days at work this summer uh, doing comedy on the road, so I had to, I had to quit my job. And um, I don't know if you guys have quit your job recently, but it is, it's like the greatest high in the world. I've never tried heroin, but I, it can't be as good as putting in your two weeks notice. And then working those two weeks, it's so great, you can do anything you want, you can like mule kick the product. <laughs> what are they gonna fire you and pay you unemployment? <laughs> I did learn though, the worst, here's the worst thing about being, not having a job, is uh, I, like, I lost my excuse forever when I wanted to leave, like whenever I want to leave a social gathering early, I would just lie and I'd be like, sorry, I gotta work early tomorrow. I gotta go. I love to stay at this party and continue listening to the rest of your story about your upcoming knee surgery. So riveting, so riveting. Unfortunately, I have to work early But like, if everyone knows I don't have a job, I gotta be like, sorry, 
you're the most boring person ever. <laughs> I don't. I hope your knee. Se I hope your knee surgery gets botched and you get a peg leg. <laughs> Even in the event that you get a peg leg, you'd be the only person to bore up a peg leg story. <laughs> I'm saying if you quit your job, you gotta tell the truth. It's terrible. Jobs are all lying anyway. You know, like, like when you go to, like when you go to work in the morning and your coworker says good morning, that's a lie. <laughs> You say good morning back, that's a lie. Good morning is when I wake up at 11.59. <laughs> My coworker's not in front of me. We all know job interviews are lying. Do you like a fast-paced work environment? I hate all four of those words. That's terrible. There's a famous quote by uh, Harry Truman. He said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. If I was on the kitchen staff when he said that, I'd be like, sounds great, I'll be in the break room texting. <laughs> awesome deal. What are your strengths? That's another question. Don't have any. I don't think I have any strengths. <laughs> There's only one question in a job interview I do know how to answer. And I, it's what are your weaknesses? That's the only one I actually know the answer to, but like you can't answer that one honestly. It's a shame. I would rock that question. Mr. Malterno, what are your weaknesses? Glad you asked. Carelessness. Lack of empathy, inability to multitask, sloth, wrath, gluttony, and also, got all the sins. Still think the word titty is funny. Never cleaned out the curing. I think I'm hot shit when they forget to charge me for guacamole and chipotle. I make terrible mixed CDs. And I still make mixed CDs. <laughs> That's the point when they uh, point me out of, uh, out of the thing. Uh, I'm going to end on that one, guys. You've been fun. Thank you very much for listening to me. You guys have been fun. And we'll get someone out there on stage. start off with one of my first poems. So this poem is about this new initiative that's going on now. It's called uh, Issue One, where it's basically taking F4, F5 uh, felony non-violent drug offenses and turning them into misdemeanors. And so, you know, this was something that was like near and dear and people were, had asked me to write something about it. So I got something, so here it is. It's time to address the elephant in the room. The issue that people want to sweep under the rug, a community people seem to be scared of, keeping them in a cell when the addiction is the prison. This is issue one. Let's have this conversation. Let's talk about the system and how it's been complacent. You say that prison is the best answer, then the next step is the halfway. Having people come into the space and treating them like the illness is the choice that they decided to propagate. Treating them like children, rules that you're instilling. Dehumanizing the body, stressing the mind. The only escape that they see is the needle to clear their mind. This is what prison feels like. 
Wake up and realize, as you stand on crime and punishment, the death of overdoses is prevalent. They work the program with a felony record trying to find a job that won't hire the drug addicted felon. And all they hear are false promises made to their accomplishments. And what makes it harder is when you see firsthand when you're working the system trying to change the culture of it. From the inside, you would think it's the 80s and it's 2018. And issue one needs to happen because too many deaths have been seen. Fentanyl, cocaine, and heroin, the big three, are making them escape the reality of the context they're in. The system of injustice, the racial component, that the system cared when the opiates hit the white face, but you criminalize the black face for crack and cocaine. That hit our space. Now let's talk face to face. Issue one will set the captive screen of the cell they're in, but it will also pressure you to facilitate a treatment and see the humanity that they have never have been given and bring families back together instead of seeing the pain through the window pane of their freedom that's been taken. Issue one, let's have this conversation. Issue one, use your pen to vote this in. Issue one, let treatment and their humanity coexist. Issue one, let's make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. So, a little bit about me is I've been writing now for about two years. And as you can see, like my heart is for, you know, marginalized people. And so, this next poem I got is I wrote this when I was uh, witnessing a talk. So, there was a uh, native speaker that came. His name is uh, Mark Charles. And he talked about. Um, basically everything indigenous and things that I didn't know. And so as I was just sitting there, I was really, really captivated by what he had to say. So I kind of wrote a poetic response to what he had mentioned. So here the, here's this one. The revolution will not be televised. Ain't that the truth? Because there is a crime that's been committed and the truth of it will get ugly too. Prison should be the reality of what has been done systemically. Let me tell you who I'm talking to. So hear me clearly. If you're white, male, Christian, cis, straight with land ownership, you are not safe for me. This pen is my weapon and I aim it with precision so beautifully. Let's have this accountability because this has been confusing me. You lied to us when we were children about Abraham Lincoln. Honest Abe freed the slaves, the hero of your history. But let's take that deceitful mask you wear so blissfully. He, had, he was no better than Hitler. Let's review the history. He said that if there was a way to keep slavery and make the union, he would have jumped and taken it seriously. He murdered over 200 native people by the stroke of his pen, not seeing their humanity. And never wanted us as equal, just didn't want the stink of war on his idea to store the 400 years of oppression just translates into the prison he reformed to take the liberties of people of color using the declaration of their independence, preamble and using it to keep us at three-fifths and women and natives ignored. And what I got in store is the truth that hit me to the core. Richard Pratt from 1892 saying slavery is bad but it civilized the Negro. Left in Africa, savagery would have been reality, taking our language, taking our tribe, teaching us English like we should be grateful. For the opportunity making us Christian, pimping the church to fit their supremacy, making our people look at the faith with trauma and hesitancy. Swallow that bitter fruit while we have worn the scars of the painful truth. And I mean this with all offense and rudeness, given that if you say Christians are oppressed, then you have been seriously, blissfully misinformed. Let me know when you hung from a tree while people watch celebrated the hunt for the night. Let me know when people take your land because they feel like it and they have the right. Let me know. When that happens, and I'll gladly fight on your side, but since that's not the case, accountability is what you're getting for the pain of people of color, LGBT, and women tonight. Republicans and Democrats, red versus blue. All I see is Democrats and Republicans, just gangs and suits, fighting for territory using your pens to shoot at each other without thinking of the people in between that will get caught in your crossfire, soliciting people to your side with frost promises to hide under. On the side of justice for picking a side only makes me wonder if your pen will shoot me in the back and kill me for trusting you when the bullet you shoot is the stop and frisk. The bullet you shoot is the definition of marriages between man and woman. What you shoot 
is turning our pain into a political move to raise your group. Republicans villainizing our group and Democrats raising to power our pain but not showing up when it counts. I'm ashamed of you. The violence of women has been your truth. Anita Hill and Dr. Ford crucified for telling the truth. Treating them like Christ, God is woman, the uncomfortable proof that the ego of a man that takes precedence over survivor's testament. Ask our president. I want y'all to feel this. I want y'all to hear this. We the people, all men are created equal and straight. Bullshit. We live in a society created by white men for white men, by Christians for Christians, by colonizers for colonizers. So people ask how do we correct it? People ask how to change it? Well, first acknowledge it and take heed in the uncomfortable. Because if you don't take ownership, then this life, there'll be more of this. So my next poem was a more difficult one for me to write. So ever since the highlight of like Me Too, it's been kind of, it's been affecting, it's been affecting me like in my heart and my mind. Because everything I hear is, is that whenever a survivor comes up and said, this happened to me by this person, the questions that are asked are, are you sure this happened? Or did, what did you wear? Or this and that and the other. And it really, it's really affect, it's, it really affects me. And so I took a step back and I kind of just wrote this out. So here's me too. Me fucking too. Yes, I said it, me too. I am not afraid to proclaim that it's happened to me, see. But what's really killing me is that when you go through a violation so deep and you are told to go report it to the police and the first question they ask is how much did you drink? How short was the dress? Have you ever had consensual sex? Like a violation couldn't have happened if you've had sex before, see. Those questions never came to me. But the questions that came for me were the questions that make me see. Why didn't you fight him off? You're a man, you should have pushed him off, decked him hard so you knew what's up. But unless you've been in a position, you wouldn't know the feeling of being stiff, frozen in time. Waiting until it's over so you hope you survive. Then when you bend over and cry because the first thought that's in the back of your mind is the dirt you feel that you can't see. Then the blame on yourself you wish that you couldn't see. But the thoughts of it being your fault is plaguing you to non-belief. And then you want to scream and unfortunately, you see the wolf in sheep's clothing. Walking around wielding power you can't believe, knowing he got away with murder. The victim is my dignity. And then men like him take so much power they can do anything, even be president. But I'm here to set a precedent. I'm not going to let them shut me up because my pen is a lethal weapon. I will share my truth so you hear my message that I hear and believe you when that cannot be contested. I feel your pain when I write this. My anger rises, ready to fight this. My soul with pride, ready to change this. Living in your eyes, ma, I give you my heart and I'm shameless. So this goes out to all of the Me Too's, the vocal and non-vocal. I feel you and I keep fighting till they hear you. With tears in my eyes and resilience in my heart, I will fight until those perpetrators get torn apart like Nas and Ethan. Those Jay-Z's won't know what hit them. You will feel my wrath, believe this. This goes to all of you sick and twisted because a lot of you are trash and we are woke to see past the million dollar smile and cash exposing you pu publicly. The Kevin Spacey's, the Bill Cosby's, the Brock Turner's, even Brett Kavanaugh, y'all catching this fade publicly. Because the courts protect y'all so readily and y'all got us hiding in the curtain because your power makes us uncertain. Turning y'all in will be worth the shame. Worth the tears, the hurt, the pain, but our power is collective. When there's so many to expose you, you can try your best effort. But the mask is fading with your best efforts. Because there's only one of you and many of your survivors that have gone on record. To my survivors, just know I love you. With every ounce that's true. Your strength inspires me to write this cold hard truth. 
Your courage makes me shed light on this proof. Know that I support you and will fight till they see the truth. Thank you. Me too. So, so my next, my next poem is my, my coming out poem. So, it's, I wrote this poem because there's a lot of intersection with like the, like the LGBT community and like the black community in a sense of in, pre, in presentation to the world. So, to better understand it, just hear this poem. I'm a black trans woman with a death wish. In time, you will understand that as a black trans woman walking around accepting yourself and engaging in hope unapologetically, you stroll accepting myself as you know I'm a black trans woman with a death wish. With that acceptance comes recklessness. Now let's unpack and check this. With your skin tone, you're perceived as dangerous and murderous. The darker the skin, the more hate than you know. Walking through a store following you, scoping, make sure you don't steal anything. Blackness is the bump in the night, but I'm a black trans woman with a death wish. The death wish of wanting to live my life, knowing that other black folks hate me, has a distaste of me, wants to jump me, wants to shoot me, with questions people want me to answer to. What's between my legs? Why aren't you a man? Is it in your head? You're a black man, why can't you accept it? It's just the media tearing up the masculinity of a black man, but what they don't understand is that to be black is the acceptance of self. So I can say proudly, unapologetically, without a shadow of a doubt, that I am a black trans woman with a death wish. Because when I live my truth, I don't care who knows. I don't care if it shows. And I hope you know that I just came out so you now know that I'm a black trans woman with a death wish. And now you know. This next one, I grew up in a church context. So like my context kind of started as I grew up in the house of Jehovah's Witnesses. Sorry to hear that. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Just about. And um, it's funny, like when you grow up in the context and then you find out you're like a trans person and, and you're also black and, and then like it's the homophobia of it, and then like on top of that, like the racism of it, and on top of that, like everything that you gotta deal with within that, like it's very interesting and it's heartbreaking at the same time. So my next poem, When Church Hurts. When Church Hurts. This poem took a lot to write because this opens my deepest hurts from the church that made my heart cry. Growing up in a church, it felt like home and a safe place. A place where I can be me and find comfort and intake. Where I'm not so alone in the beliefs I embrace, but recently that reality has been misplaced. I'm a black trans person with a death wish, let me explain. Having those identities feels like war in my safe place. When they say I'm going to hell because my identity is not commonplace. I'm mentally ill, a bit of prayer will set me straight. They were thugs, the police were doing their job, get on our knees to pray. And what's driving me cray is that the hate makes me want to stay away from that place. I love Jesus, but where is the church that I can pray? Who will accept my black and queer face? Who will pray for me when my soul aches? Who will hold me in the hard taste? I used to say the church is the place for the space, but in this 26 year, huh, I can no longer say. This, I love Jesus, so I continue to pray this. When will hate leave our people? When will people not look at me with disdain and evil? When will people look at me and see one of God's people? I need answers because I'm God's child. He was kicked out of the house by people who forgot that it's our father's house. This is church hurt. My soul is bleeding out. This is church hurt. Pray God to bleed it out. Church hurt. I pray for a fix every day. Church hurt. 
Christians like me feel this every day in church hurt. God, please take this hurt away. So this next poem, so the context of this poem is I went to this dance movie series at, in, in Africa, because that's where I'm from. And it was a video that affected me where it was a, it was a poem that was being read about like America and then like you see all of the, like the different elements that scared the dancer and like you could feel the fear and pain in his like dance. And then from that, like, I felt that hurt, sadness and anger within me. So this is something that I kind of wrote for this. So here it goes. I wish I could kill racism. I mean, really kill it. I mean, put the gun to his neck and pulling the trigger. I mean, taking the knife and really seeing his blood spilling. I mean, beating him with my hands to really feel my pain because what he does really drives me insane. He tells my people slavery is a choice, lying through his teeth to keep the black people separated and deceived. The unfortunate struggle is that slavery is mental when the confusion is set in you, keeping the woke at bay. And the sleep in the bed sheets, fighting a war on two fronts, the oppression at B, and the misinformed speech, damn you racism. You really got me twisted. You made my parents complacent, saying the death of you won't ever come. Turn friends into enemies, my heart's is sunk. The distrust of white folks is forever tucked in my brain while I try to keep my smile stuck on my face as I navigate whether you love me all the way or call me nigger with the rape, a rope in the chain. You made police scared of me. Shoot me on sight like the monster you told them we would be. You made white women scream rapists when I crossed past them on the street. You took away my chance or at a home and you labeled me thug and a criminal. Racism, this is reality. You dropped my people in the colorblind and the hatred, the privilege and the prison, the bullet holes in the system, hate speech and the opinion with what feels like no end in sight. We have resided to take our own life, our continuous fight, so racism, it's time to read you last rites. Before you die tonight, for 400 years, you took our life. Our freedom was subject to currency and price. You made us the boogeyman that go bump in the night, turning nighttime into our last rites to our life. You turned our crimes into black on black, when in reality, it's desperate people wanting a life less hard and trashed. And so tonight, racism is where you die. And pulling this trigger, this is goodbye. In every hated thought that equates to black life, rest in hell, racism. There's no redemption for you. next one was inspired by Kanye West. Uh. <laughs> uh. Oh, Kanye West. Oh, the pandering asshole. Anyway, um, so he, uh, this is in one of his many rants where he was like, 400 years, slavery is a choice. And then, you know, we all gave him that, that the biggest side eye of 2018. Um, so, it really made me like think, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna sit back and write, write something about this, so here, is it, here it goes. If slavery was a choice, damn, things would be different. But it seems that, that some people think that the choice was gifted and the 400 years was just wishful thinking that we could have stopped any time. Oh, how deceiving. Well, since the idea seems to be prevalent to free thought, let me take that and give my five finger discount and replace it with a counter thought. See, if slavery was a choice, our bodies would be ours. Celebrating on, on our beloved continent now with our own history and smiles. Not worried about the supremacy so foul, the ideal beauty would be melanated skin, hair, nappy and curly and locked so beautifully. It's wild. 
If slavery was a choice, nigga would not exist. A word that carries so much weight it corrupts your bliss. You hear the word from the white face and we retaliate knowing the racist bait. They use saying we use it too, why can't they? If slavery was a choice, dark skin, light skin would not exist. No beauty would ever top another, that is a promise to get. Whether your skin is light as the sun or as dark as the moon, love the skin you're in because beauty is the gift you exude. If slavery was a choice, our businesses would be af African. Buying from each other, the wealth will be Wakandan, Afro-futuristic, our city in the year 3000, our golden age, we will be a priceless diamond, never bought or sold in. If slavery was an option, we will be treated better, not looked at as beasts that know no better. Not seen as a savage predator, treated like animals in hunting season, even though they hunt us in every season. It will be slave catchers with badges, but the master has blinders with tunnel vision describing the way I look that's similar to the community I have pride in. That's racial profiling. If slavery was a choice, we would love each other. Not have to fight for accountability on a guilty brother. If one does wrong, we come together and discuss how we do better. Learn that a black woman is valued and that culture of violence won't be protected. If slavery was a choice, my school will look better. HBCUs will be the norm. Black education will be well informed. Our books wouldn't be ripped and torn. Computers would be newer than when I was born. Lift every voice and sing would be the pledge of allegiance we adorn. Going to school would not be a chore. And it wouldn't feel like prison every time we walk through the door. If slavery was an option, I would pick no every time. Cutting off my feet, hanging me from a tree. Putting me in chains, locking me in a cage, shooting me unarmed wouldn't be the reality that is going on. So if slavery was an option, we would choose the opposite. So don't tell us it was a choice because there are too many dead because of it. Don't tell us it was a choice because we continue fighting against it. Don't tell us it was a choice when you haven't lived it. Don't say it's a choice when you are the biggest hypocrite. So please listen. We didn't have a choice to be here. But we make the choice to live and we live our truth every day and our ancestors see with a smile on their face. So no, we didn't choose our fate. Know that we elevate. Know that the lack of knowledge will never cause us to separate. Slavery wasn't a choice. That's the reality that's criticized. But we pers persevered through it all and our fight still continues on. And if we let that narrative ride, then our fight has already died. Slavery is not a choice. So how many of y'all have seen Black Panther? Woo! Yeah. So I I wrote this poem like so I saw it about five times now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw it at five five times in the theater, and um, and like the fourth or fifth time is when I, I when I went when I went on a date with uh, my girlfriend at that point, and. Um, and so I had to see it over and over and over again to really, really understand the context of it. So this is my poetic response to it. I am T'Challa. I am Killmonger. The duality in my mind holds no escape from me. You see, the anger that's in me, that my culture being stolen from me, a language that will never be known to me, living in a world where blackness is criminality that should be exterminated and sold to the highest bit of sea. That thought alone makes me grow cold, feeling no acceptance from a land made home. Huh, home. That's a distant dream, a cruel joke, and a worse nightmare. The distance always has me wondering what it's like to be back in mother's grace. The nightmare that is reality that I would be called outsider in a place I did not forsake. And the cruel joke is that my distant cousins will look at me and not accept my place. Damn. I am Killmonger. I feel like I want to burn the whole place. Bury me in the ocean where my ancestors knew that death was better than bondage. This I can relate. In 2018, those chains led me to prison gates. In 1930, the rope made its fruit so strange that Billy Holiday sung our cries from the strange stage. The reality of black pain, the cries that we contain, the lives we maintain. But T'Challa mm, is also me. 
Feeling like royalty, black skin celebrated with ease, rich culture, language spoken with ease. Our land is the epitome of the red, black, and green. Hair as nappy as we want it to be, celebration with people looking like me. Dancing on beat with a land that can only be described as pedadiso. Where the heart is, if you don't know, that's home. That's where our start is, but this duality brings my resistance. This duality brings me close to my people. This duality helps me find paradise where the outside feels like I might die, but inside is where I sign safety with mine. Duality is where we black folks live. This duality we want to intertwine within Wakanda brought us a smile and tears, reminding us of a beauty that we were taken from. I am T'Challa. I am Killmonger. This has brought me some closure that I am not just one or the other. I have pride in where I come from, but I cry because injustice hasn't been undone. I am Killmonger because they took my name and gave me theirs to remember my pain. I'm T'Challa. Celebration hasn't stopped with my people on top. I'm Killmonger. They see my pain and think it will lead to violence and shame, but what they don't realize is that this trauma only leads to my crying days, that all I want is acceptance, but all you give, give is fear and distance. Look at me with danger if my emotion paints a picture. Me against the world is not the position I'm wishing. A Tupac addition, I'm T'Challa. Even in my pride, I don't celebrate alone. The melanated queens we hold so dear and strong. We could never maneuver this world alone in a koye, as fierce as can be. Eyes, as fierce as can be. You stand on the front line staring into the eyes of the police, making your stand for black life in the face of mace, bullets, and disbelief that they don't see our humanity as shuri. Genius level to non-belief. I see the skills you bring from the wisdom you gain. Mind wondrous and vast, it's hard to maintain the beauty of your mind that cannot be described. Your intelligence with pride, pride brings tears to my eyes. A Nakia, I can't even begin. Your heart's so big that everyone can fit. Your care for the world and people that are marginalized is a gift, and I see this when you have led our movements. Black Lives Matter is led through you. The Women's March, I see that too. And the birth of intersectionality is something you have inspired too. Black women, you all embody these women. I can't fathom how great the message you give shows true strength. I cry tears for how great. Wakanda is not just a fictional place, but a place we should live our daily lives in, celebrating our blackness the way of its intent, and keeping this in our hearts as we struggle and fight the injustices and cruelty from them. I cross my arms and say Wakanda forever, because here is the knowledge you should know, then, that this is for us, by us, and no one can take this. I look up and smile because this is our creation, with no replication, forever our treasure that can never be appropriated. Wakanda forever. <laughs> Bear with me, y'all. So, my next. Well, this next one I wrote when uh, when 45 had uh, and this is my this is my last one for the evening. Um, when 45 uh, called African countries shitholes, and so it it sat really. It, it really, it really, it really hurt. And I had to write the response to it and I really sat with it and listened to it and, and listened the talking heads talk about it. So I thought I could give my artistic response to this. So here it goes. Shit whole countries. This is what show president said. Where the black and brown were bred, our ancestry stolen from this land. We come to this land where opportunity can land, but our land gets denigrated as a shithole. Let's unpack this real quick. To start off, Africa is a continent, not a country. So where do you get off not knowing this fact? You forget and you threw Haiti in the mix when they are ravaged by an earthquake, killing thousands of people within the disrespect. To the many saying everyone has AIDS, my tears are falling like waves, like Anderson's did. 
because your hate is so apparent that patriotism isn't something that even we can manage with AC. You're not the only one that feels this way. Trying to make a life, cook your food, clean your house, live our life, work our jobs just for a decent way of life. But in doing so, you say we mooch off you, take your jobs, living off the government. For heaven's sake, these are jobs that are offered when we come through your gates. Sending our kids through college with jobs like these is the only way. So they can receive the ever famous college degree speaking a language that's foreign that you can't relate. English is your first language. And English is our second, third, or eighth. You lived here since birth. We came here at mid-age, hoping our children can be great. But getting called rapists and murderers makes us feel disengaged. Afraid to walk out the door because ICE might put us in a cage. I understand this too. See, just like you, an immigrant, coming from a land that's different, with customs and a religion that's looked at as the villain. Scared to walk out the door because you might scream terrorists or beat me up for the hijab I wear. With this pride for my faith that can't compare with this banning me from this country for the faith that I'm with. And with brown skin, it is very clear about the difference. I can't praise Allah without you being ignorant. Speak my language without you thinking that there's a bomb threat within it. You can't even build a clock in school without getting arrested. Let's tell the truth. These very people come from countries that shit full is your adjective. Let me take this and flip this so I hope you understand this so. Slavery was the law of the land where blacks were nothing more than property for you. The Native Americans were slaughtered with no forgiveness because of land you stole from them too. The Japanese Americans were put in internment camps because of the fear of the skin they're in. And you want to talk about shit whole countries? Well, let's look at the one for it. Thank you very much, Jamie. Let's give it up for him another time. All <laughs> um, right, we're going to have our open mic. Um, who, put your hand up if you are interested in being in the open mic. I see two hands. All right. So I will get us started. We're going to do um, recorded open mic first. If you want to have your piece not recorded, then say so, and we can shut off the recording device. You are not going to hell. You're not going to hell. Nobody is, and definitely not you. The capital C church tried to sell our souls back to us as frightened puppets, each of us paying over and over. Their scam has run its course. We know the good news in each cell of our bodies. It has nothing to do with blood washing or obedience to a highly variable code. God has hidden God's self in the last place many would think to look, inside of us. Original sin lied to us, constructed a torturous narrative, and convinced most people to live fear into existence. But the mystics knew. The mystics recognized the face of God in each of us. They saw through the illusion that holy and human are separate, when in fact, we never stopped being love. The institution used words like heretic, false prophet, witch, and sinner to condemn those they could not control. But we are love, and we are not going to hell. We are the embodiment of the divine, each of us, whether we feel empowered or not. Sin is not doing bad things. It's any perception that separates us from knowing that God is in us and we are in God. We are love. They said that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. What they left out is, so are we. There is no angry God who must be appeased by a sacrifice to the death. There is only the spirit who longs for each one to know our true intended nature. We're not going to hell. We may create a hell for each other but we also have the power to know each other. The divine in me recognizes the divine in you. How absurd that this notion seems Eastern instead of native to everywhere. So no, sweetheart, you're not going to hell. 
You cannot lose God's love because it is not conditional no matter what they said. Now go and be love because love is who you are. All right, Daria, would you like to come up here and perform something for us? All right, give it up for Daria Quinn. So, um, listening to Jamie talk about uh, Black Panther has inspired me to uh, kind of go with an impromptu piece here about my dad. My dad is racist, and I have absolutely no idea how to talk to him about it. I've tried for years. I've tried every possible way to bring him around, make him understand why he's racist, but he won't listen. Recently, we discussed the Black Panther movie. And he said, oh, I liked it, but it was a little too Afrocentric for me. It's almost as if black people were thinking they're better than white folk. Well, maybe they are, Dad. You know why? Because every single black person I have ever known ever read it about, ever spoke to, ever saw, showed an incredible amount of poise and strength that a white person never has to. And I don't know how to be that strong in the face of all of that oppression and discourtesy and violence and hatred. I don't know how to be that strong. And they inspire me to keep going. Because if they can do it, I can do it. Maybe someday, Dad, you'll understand that maybe you're right. Black folk are better than you. Uh, and this last one is um, something I wrote when I realized I had a, an epiphany recently that I, as a trans woman, face a lot of discrimination and violence, but because I don't appear feminine, I can sometimes hop. But with recent events, I've also learned that that ability to hide is limited, and that someday I won't be able to anymore. And this is about that. Riding on the bus with headphones on, I don't appear to be feminine, so cute people usually leave me alone. I've managed to go a very long time without being physically attacked. High school is the last time I remember anything like that. Still, the reality of being perceived as feminine in public comes with risks. Risks I can seemingly mitigate by appearing less feminine. But I wouldn't call this presentation masculine. It gives power to the false idea that masculine presentation is the default setting. There's nothing inherently masculine about a hoodie and sweatpants. Hell, more women I know than men wear this stuff anyway. Men usually wear shorts or jeans or slacks. Women wear sweats and yoga pants, unless you're me, then hopefully you're just invisible. Because I know this won't last. The only reason I haven't been attacked since my transition is because not enough time has passed. This illusion of masculinity doesn't really protect me. It only exists as a deterrent something I do for peace of mind. One of these days, I'm going to be attacked. It's not going to matter what I look like or how I dress. I can dress in a way that makes me less likely to be targeted, but I will be targeted. Whether it's by a man who wants to assert his power over a woman, or from a bigot who thinks he knows my gender better than I do. It could be a sex crime, a hate crime, or maybe even both. I might survive the experience, but maybe not. And every time I step outside of my home, I am at risk, even if all I'm doing is riding on the bus with headphones on. Thank you, Daria. I think Azrael is coming up next because Kathy wants to not be recorded. So please give it up for the director of Writing Nights, Azrael Johnson! <laughs> Yeah.
Meow raced through the woods. He didn't want to be running. He didn't like running. But the heated breaths of the dog creatures made him run faster than he'd ever run before. Faster than the birds. Faster than the mice. The trees whipped by with his movement. Meow could duck under the trees and not lose speed, but the dogs couldn't. They had to jump and lose time in the air. Ahead, Meow saw a tree with thick bark. The tree would be perfect for climbing fast. Just ten kittens high and he would be sick. Meow pushed himself faster, and then an instant cut to the right past the tree. The dog creatures crashed into one another, trying to change direction. Meow's claws gripped and re-gripped the tree as he clambered up the tree bark. Up! And up, every hummingbird heartbeat hammered in Meow's chest. Five kittens, six kittens, seven kittens, eight kittens, nine kittens. Snap! Meow's little tail barely avoided the dog creatures, but the startle dislodged Meow's left foreclaws. Another slobbering jaw snapped at Meow's little body, barely missing his back legs. Meow's left claw dug in again. Up and up, ten kittens, eleven kittens, twelve kittens, thirteen kittens, higher until Meow felt safe. Almost triumphantly, Meow hissed a mighty kitten hiss. The dog creatures kept jumping up and snapping, but fell short. Meow's mouth hung open. Saliva dripped with anger and fear in equal measure. The hunger emanated from the dogs. Meow didn't know why they were after him. It would be barely a swallow. Meow climbed up higher into the tree and folded his paws under his chest. He closed his eyes and waited. So that was, um, that's the beginning of my NaNoWriMo novel, I guess. Um, so I'm going to try again this year. I've been trying the past, like, million years, and I haven't won NaNo yet. Um, so I'm going to base a character in my novel universe in Pinnacle. Um, so if anybody is interested in seeing writing that's in Canton, I brought one of our Take a Picture flyers. Uh, there's also a a list you can sign up for to get email updates. Um, so, uh, Ariana and Finn and I went to the main Kent reading that happens over at Last Exit. And so I got some some short pieces out of that, so I'm going to read those. Just trying to figure them. It'll be fun. I know it isn't the same, but I feel a little out of my element, sitting in an avalanche of poets, wondering if poet voice will cascade down the mountain of poetic conformity. A monotone disaster, shaking in waves like vocal earthquake, distracting from the brain with boring tones. This is the Keanu Reeves of poetry, and every man of words allowing room for the listener to insert themselves into the pieces like The Matrix. If you die during the piece, you die in real life. <laughs> that was one. Um, so, some uh, clown uh, dropped a certain word that I will not repeat, and so this piece happened. The blackening blacks stereotyped in the white old guy's attempt at William S. Burroughs' naked lunch. Wrapping that word in fiction doesn't make it okay to say in 2018. I hate to be the political correct, but geez, you aren't Mark Twain. It isn't the 1800s. Even if, even when it was accepted, it wasn't really acceptable. Yeah, I know. I hate the idea of not using words. Believe me, but until POC are no longer longer oppressed, until the system no longer favors your skin color and gender, I feel like you can pick another word. There are so many. It is. This isn't white genocide. This is a beseeching to be slightly more sensitive, you can still be edgy without racism. I promise. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of Daniel Thompson, but uh, this next piece is sort of about that. It kind of explains it. Um, I hope after I die, hippies make songs out of my pieces. I eventually got focused on somebody who was sitting right across from me as we were there. Um, he had on a really cool, like, I don't, I don't remember what the kind of hat is called, but I used to have one. It's like a newsboy hat, like it's got the clip in the front, and I used to have one myself, which I really liked. Um, 
I wonder if it hurts to pinch one's face in pensiveness for two plus hours. This must turn into a habit so ingrained that muscle memory will never be unlearned. A memory so deep that it will imprint itself on the face of my children that everyone who sees me must know I am a serious artist as I attend the monthly poet open mic and sit like the thinker with a newsy cap. This pose will also permeate my children. They might even come out that way. My poor wife, she will suffer, so the birth will be easy. Um, and one more. When I was a kid, my friend believed so hard in the Bible that he said men were missing a rib because of the existence of women. Thank you. Thank you, Alto. All right, Kathy, if you'll make your way up here, as well as turning off the recording devices, and you'll get to close this out for this evening. All right, so please let's welcome Kathy to the stage. Either, either side, there's stairs on either side, Kathy.